Dear Heavenly Father, we, we come before you in this season of Advent, in the season of Christmas, the season of grace. I, I pray that as we reflect on you and your goodness, Lord, would you just be in this place, in our hearts, speaking to us, convicting us of the things that we need to be convicted of. Father, we come today just asking for your insight into our lives, insight into how we should live and, and how we should act. Uh, Father, we, we love you. Keep our eyes fixated on Christ and the cross. We love you in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I, I really do love Christmas, and I think that's why um, having a Christmas series every year is one of my favorite things. Uh, for me, I, I kind of prep myself uh, for Christmas because Christmas, Christmas isn't just one day for me. I, I, I like to kind of celebrate the whole, the whole season. I've probably mentioned this before uh, in church and uh, in Christmas series before, but uh, what I like to do is I like to, you know, drink a lot of hot chocolate. I like to uh, kind of get by the fire and, and, and make sure that you get nice and toasty. Uh, I like to watch a lot of Christmas movies. Um, the kind of the best for me are Elf. I love watching Elf. Home Alone and Die Hard. Just like kind of watching those, uh, you kind of get in the mood for Christmas and you get in the mood for um, just the festivities. I remember growing up, uh, Christmas for my best friend uh, in California, they, they literally had so many Christmas decorations that they had to buy a storage unit to, to hold all of their decorations. And so they would go and, and they would bring me and we would go to the storage unit and we would load it into a U-Haul and they would take it to their house and they would deck their house. There was, their house was one of those houses that they had like Santa on the roof, they had little elves in the lawn, they had all these different things. And so Christmas was always that time that was just so much fun. And so kind of the older I've become, the less of that magic, that Christmas magic comes around. And so it's, I, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that uh, Christmas now becomes a very expensive holiday. You have to buy everyone gifts. And so that, that joy, that magic just kind of goes away because you're like, oh man, this is going to cost so much. But there is a still um, a joy that does come because when everyone gathers for Christmas and, and we have time together just to eat a lot of, a, a lot of good food, uh, a lot of that Thanksgiving food that, that we want to do all, all over again with the turkey and all the hams and all that, that good dessert and all that stuff. So like gathering together as a family and just kind of going around and gathering on the Christmas tree, opening up presents, and, and there is that joy. And, and now having kids where I see my kids opening up the presents and, and them opening up and being so excited because they have so many more toys. Uh, there is still that magic, but I think a, a lot of it now is, is because Christmas and New Year's are, are so close together, Christmas is a time where I, I look back at the past, I look back at the year, and whether it was a hard year or it was a great year, it's just looking back and, and, and kind of solidifying those memories and solidifying those experiences and in that week from Christmas to New Year's is looking forward to what next year has to offer. And whether your year was terrible, whether your year was good, New Year's and, and entering into New Year's is that joy of having hope that next year would be even better. And I think that's kind of how I am this year, is looking back at, at um, 2019 and as we're entering in 2020, as we're entering into the, the 20s, and it's, it's kind of weird that, that we're, we're done with this decade, it is looking forward with hope. You know, what will 2020 bring? What will this next decade bring? And, and a lot of that just comes with a lot of speculation, a lot of expectations, and, and who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? But I think even um, entering into that New Year season of hope and expectation, uh, with the joy of Christmas, with the joy of being around family and loved ones and surrounded by presents and, and trees and, and mistletoe and all those different things going on, hopefully it puts you in the right frame of mind that next year will be positive, that we're not looking at next year and being like, it's going to be terrible, it's going to be gloomy. Hopefully none of you um, are a Scrooge, and, and hopefully a lot of you in your families can have that positive outlook on next year. But I, today I'm, I'm going to talk about um, a prophecy that the prophet Isaiah brought on the people of Israel. And we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 9. And I, I need to frame it to you what this prophecy is all about. 
And, and, and I guess the way you put it is, is, is Israel, the nation of Israel has had a terrible year. And not just a terrible year, they've had a terrible decade. And not just a terrible decade, but a terrible couple of decades because uh, the nation of Israel has, has had these terrible kings. And not only had these terrible kings, but they are constantly being, being invaded and being placed into exile. And so uh, first they're in exile by the Assyrians, by the Persians, and then they're in exile by the Babylonians. And so all of these things are going on, and so they're just having a bad, a bad century. And, and, and the nation of Israel doesn't really have anything to look forward to because right now they're under the rule of King Ahaz. And, and the way that Isaiah ex- describes the rule of King Ahaz is that it's very dark. It's very bleak. He explains King Ahaz is an evil king, and because he's an evil king, the nation of Israel is kind of under this overarching moral darkness, that the rulers and the leader of the time is morally corrupt, and he's not close and in tune with God, and therefore there's this shroud of darkness that comes over them. And so Isaiah gives this Christmas message. And again, it's 500 years before the birth of Christ. But he gives this Christmas message to bring hope to these people that are living under this evil regime, that are living under this oppressive government, this morally bankrupt government. And he's bringing this message of hope. And so in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2, uh, we'll start from them. It says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And this darkness is what I've talked to you about under the, under the rule of King Ahaz. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff For his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle, tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as the fuel for fire. For to us, a child, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the, of the Lord of hosts will do this. A beautiful prophecy that Isaiah is giving to a people living in grim and in a bleak situation. And I imagine just being one of the people listening to the prophet, prophet Isaiah talk about this Messiah, this Savior, the one who is going to be a righteous king, a good, a good ruler over the nation of Israel, that all of the bloodshed that has happened in the past, that this is going to be the prince of peace, that this new ruler is going to be called mighty God, everlasting father, wonderful counselor, that these names are given to this ruler, but more importantly to this child. Not by human people are, are not not by human giving is are these names given, but it's by God. God is the one who is calling this child, this son that is given to the people that God has named him these things. And it's beautiful because Isaiah is giving hope. He's giving hope unto the nation of Israel. And it's this hope that kind of goes throughout even the, the rest of the prophets. But the, I, Isaiah is giving these people who are being overtaken and overrun by these various empires and countries, by these bad kings, these bad and evil rulers that are bringing them to demise and to failure. Isaiah is giving them this message of hope. 
this message of Christmas, that a child will be born, a son will be given, and even that is very significant because he's already explaining, he's already prophesying God's plan of redemption is already being laid in the groundworks of the Old Testament. It's really important that we understand when Isaiah says a child is born, a son is given, he is already telling us what the Messiah is going to look like. When we think of the Savior of the world, the Savior of the people of God, God could have easily, God could have easily made it so that Jesus came down in a chariot of fire. That Jesus would come down wearing a crown of gold, having a sword in his hand and a scepter in the other, coming down in a flaming chariot, well, you know, driven by you know, flying, flying horses, and, and just coming down and landing in Jerusalem and saying, I'm the king. I am the one that, they, as, that you're going to call the prince of peace. I'm the one you're going to call mighty God. I'm the one who's the wonderful counselor. I am the everlasting father. And Jesus could have been very easily the one who comes down on this chariot of fire, driven by these flying horses with a crown on his head and a sword in his hand and a staff, a royal staff and a, and a garment of gold and purple and just dressed in, in beautiful colors, royalty, to be the king. But Isaiah is already beginning to prophesy the way and manner in which Jesus is going to come into this world, not like that, but he's going to come as a child. He's going to come as a baby. And he's a son. And again, I, I can imagine the people hearing this prophecy about this child that's going to be born, all of a sudden their expectations of the hope that is given, this message of hope, that they're already beginning to interpret it in the way that is going to go well with them. I mean, they're, they're hearing this message of, of a son that is born, and so they're probably already going around and being like, okay, so he's going to be born into royalty. So maybe King Ahaz and his wife are going to give birth to a son, and this son that is born from King Ahaz or from any of the other kings, maybe this is the Messiah. And so imagine as the nation of Israel have all these kings and they're hearing this prophecy from Isaiah and all of these children are born from royalty, from the kings and queens, I can imagine that the, that the, kings, uh, the king's wise men, the king's uh, kind of scholars are probably saying, this is the child that Isaiah was talking about. King, this is, you know, King Ahaz, King Hezekiah, King, King whatever, Josiah, whatever king it would be, when they have a child, did you know that Jesus, that, 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 that instead of Jesus, that this child is most likely Emmanuel, that this child, this child is God, he is the Messiah. And I imagine that child being raised up, kind of thinking, okay, I'm, I'm this kid who is being prophesied by Isaiah. And so I could imagine... I could imagine the shock, the shock that as, as each of these kings have children and their children grow up to be evil, to grow up and bring even more darkness, that the people became very disappointed. They became very disillusioned. Again, Isaiah makes his prophecy and we don't see Jesus being born for hundreds of years later. Isaiah makes this prophecy, and I'm sure the people who are hearing this prophecy, hoping for hope. They want, they want the Messiah to come. They don't want to be under the rule and reign of these other empires. They want to be free because they're the people of God. And so you would think God is going to save them. God is going to bring, bring them salvation. But it doesn't come for another 500 years. Another 400 years before Jesus comes on the scene. So their expectations are already thwarted. And guess what? When Jesus comes, he doesn't meet their expectations even then. Again, they're expecting the Messiah to come as the Prince of Peace, the Everlasting Father, Mighty God, Wonderful Counselor. But what you know, you and I know about Jesus and the Christmas story is that Jesus was born in a manger. He was born in a farm. He was born where the animals eat and they poop. 
And not only was he born in a place that was not fit for a king, he was born unto a woman, a born unto a very young girl, actually. She was most likely 13 or 14 years old. She was born to a young virgin girl who wasn't even married yet. And again, imagine the shame. Imagine the shame of Mary as she is bearing the Prince of Peace. As she is bearing the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the Almighty God, and the people around her are not, are not saying, oh, <laughs> your child is going to be the Savior of the world. If I can use language, if I can use language that isn't inappropriate but really means what it is, people probably looked at her and said, you're going to give birth to a bastard. We don't even know who really the father is because you're not married. Jesus wasn't born into this situation where he was given, he was given the glory that was due, that when Isaiah is making this prophecy, the people's expectation of the Messiah coming in is that he's going to come in triumphant. He's going to come dressed in gold. He's going to come in with all, all of the glory of God because he has these titles given to him by God Almighty, God himself. But we have to remember that a lot of what Christmas is is humble expectations. Today's, today, the message for you is this, is that a lot of times your hope is placed on external context. Your hope is, ex, your hope is based on external circumstances rather than on the promise of God. Your hope is placed on things of this world rather than the word that God has promised unto you. When people met Jesus for the first time, he always, he always was not what they expected. And I know that sounds weird, but that's actually how it goes. And especially for the disciples. Jesus was not the guy, was not the guy that they expected. And, and even the disciples who were closest to him, and they saw him do the miracles, they saw him do all these amazing things. I mean, imagine just being Peter. And as you're Peter, you're seeing Jesus feed the 5,000. You're seeing Jesus heal the sick and give sight to the blind and raise people from the dead. Imagine being Peter and as you are walking into Jerusalem, as Palm Sunday is happening and all the palms are, are, are being put down on the ground and Jesus is, is entering into the city of Jerusalem and people are saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Peter's probably thinking, all right. Finally, it's all paid off. All of the hard work and all the things that we've been working these past three years, we're finally going to get our reward. And imagine just being Peter and the other disciples as Jesus is walking into the city and as he's going in on the donkey and all the palm leaves are being, are, are being laid out and Peter is just being like, yeah, I was there from the beginning. I was there, and I saw him. He called me. I'm one of the disciples. How awesome that is. But the thing about Peter is that his hope, his hope before the death of Christ was based on external circumstances rather than the word of God. Because Jesus kept telling Peter, Peter, I'm going to die. <laughs> Peter, they're going to kill me. Peter, I know that they're, they're welcoming me in as king, but a few days from now, only, only half a week from now, they're going to kill me. They're going to crucify me. I'm going to die. And, and Peter says, no, <laughs> that's not going to happen. There's no way you're going to let that happen. There's no way that you can die because you are the king of kings. You are the Lord of lords. You are the Messiah. And Jesus says to Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. Imagine being Peter. 
Imagine being Peter in that situation. He's, he's probably thinking, he, he's like, what, what, Jesus, you fulfill all the prophecies that Isaiah is talking about. You fulfill all the prophecies of the Messiah. I've seen it with my eyes. I've seen the power that you have, that you can raise people from the dead even. You can heal anyone you talk to. The words, the way that you interpret the scriptures, only the Messiah would be able to speak with that kind of authority. What do you mean you are going to die? You can't die. Peter's hope was based on the external. And the reason why people on Palm Sunday were welcoming Jesus in was because they thought Jesus was going to overthrow the Roman Empire. The external expectations was that Jesus, as he is marching in and and being triumphant in his entry into Jerusalem, was going to come out and his crown of gold was going to come on his head and he's going to have a flaming sword and even Caesar himself would have to bow before Jesus. Because the way that they're reading this passage is that the government is going to be on his shoulders. That the government of Christ, of the Messiah, is going to grow forever and ever. And so their expectation was on the external circumstance rather than what the Word of God really was saying. Jesus, we know, after his triumphal entry on Palm Sunday, that on that Friday... He's murdered. And he's murdered on a cross in the most shameful way. That the Prince of Peace, the Lord of Lords, the Mighty God, the Wonderful Counselor, he's put to death a criminal's death. He's given the death penalty. And just imagine being the disciples knowing the prophecies, I mean, hearing it. I mean, everyone's kind of pointing to how Jesus is fulfilling all these prophecies, and all of a sudden, Jesus is on the cross. He's dying. Their hope was crushed because their hope was based on the external expectations that they had of what Jesus was supposed to look like. Jesus was supposed to be victorious. How can you say you're victorious, Jesus, is if you're on a cross, If you're hanging on a cross, how can we call that victory? That is utter failure. Brothers and sisters, you will experience failure in your life. You will experience things that you will look at and you will say, this was utter failure. This was the worst. This was... Absolutely not how I envisioned things to go. I, I wanted success and I thought God was going to bless me, but it seems that all I've gotten is failure upon failure upon failure. What I want to remind you of is that the disciples felt the same way. As they watched Jesus being beaten and bruised and hung on a cross, that they felt that they had failed. They felt that God had failed. You see, the hope of Christmas, the hope of Christmas is that God has already written the beginning, middle, and end. That God knew that he was going to send his son in the form of a child to be the Prince of Peace, to be Everlasting Father, to be the Mighty God, to be the Wonderful Counselor. He knew he was going to be these things now and forevermore, but he also knew what this meant, is that he knew that Jesus the Messiah was going to bring an end to all sin, but not in our expectation. Jesus was not going to end sin with a flaming sword. He was not going to bring the end of sin with a crown of gold. Instead, he brought the end of sin with a crown of thorns and nails in his hands and nails in his feet being hung on a cross. God fulfilled his promise of a Messiah of the Savior of the world. He fulfilled it, just not in the way that we would have done it. 
He did it in the way to show us his love, to show us his kindness and compassion to us. Jesus could have easily come down with a sword and killed all the Romans. He could have easily come down and killed all the Pharisees and all the Sadducees. He could have come down and killed all the pagans, all the Gentiles, all the people without faith, and he could have easily mowed them down and been that kind of Savior. The kind of Savior that would go in front of Caesar and say, Caesar, you bow down to me and I'll cut off your head. But no, we have a Savior who instead of taking the sword to those who deserve the sword, took that punishment on himself to show his love. So the hope that we have is not a God of force, is not a God who is angry, who wants, who wants wrath to be his first name. But instead we have a God who loves us dearly, that he would send his son in the form of a child, in, a, in the form of a baby, to be sent to live for us and to die for us. When I read Isaiah and I read this prophecy, like many other prophecies in the Bible, I, I, I have to put myself in the situation of the people at that time hearing the prophecy. And, and, you know, they probably had all these ideas of what the Messiah would look like. And, and imagine telling them when they're thinking of this Messiah being like a superhero, being like, you know, in royalty, being rich and famous and, and well-liked and, and just the most popular guy in the world, that when they find out that the Messiah of the world was a carpenter from Galilee. <laughs> when, when Jesus was this humble guy, not born into the royal courts of Jerusalem, but just an average dude. I, In our lives, we put so much expectation on what God is going to do to bless us. In our lives, we, we, we put so much expectation when we pray, even. When we pray for blessing, we tell God our plan and what blessing looks like for us. We say, God, do this, do this, do this. Please, but please do this, please do this, please give me this. Please let this happen and let this happen and let this happen. And I'm not saying that's bad. But what I'm saying is, is that a part of the joy of following God is that we don't dictate to God what he's going to do. Is that we humbly accept whatever he brings to us. And that means even if the worst thing happens to you, your greatest fear comes true, and it happens to you, God is still going to keep his promises for you. That's a beautiful thing. If you really understand this, it's a beautiful thing that will give you eternal and unconditional joy. Is that no matter what trials you go through, no matter what hardship you go through, is if you truly understand the hope that we have in Christ, is that no matter what circumstance you're put through, is that God is still good and he's still going to use your terrible situation for his glory and his goodness. that you may feel that you are on rock bottom, that things could not get worse in any way. But see, that's when God becomes most beautiful. That's when we become most sensitive to the power of the Holy Spirit. It's because when we're at rock bottom, we don't have anywhere else to go. We don't have any more expectations. We don't have any more of these false pretenses to think that God is going to do this or God is going to do that. There, becomes, there comes in us when we hit rock bottom a humble submission of, Lord, do whatever you want because I clearly can't do anything myself. 
Lord, this situation is in your hands and yours alone. Let your will be done, not mine. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, not my will be done. Because my will is just going to mess things up even more. But your will is going to work out beautifully. This is the heart that the disciples had to learn. And they they learned it not seeing Jesus hung on the cross. They learned this attitude when they saw the resurrection. When they saw God raise Jesus from the dead and they were able to meet with him and eat with him and touch him, that's when they were able to say, all of my mourning has been turned into dancing because God can even defeat death. Do we believe in a God that can be defeated? I I really want you to answer that question. Do you believe in a God that can be defeated? Do you believe in a God that, that, that can be? Do you believe in a God that can fail? Because I believe in a God that can never fail. I believe in a God that will always love and will always be good and is perfect and is just. I believe in the Prince of Peace and the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father. I believe in a God that can never fail. So when I experience failure in my life, instead of having expectations that I have made up, I need to find those moments where I have failed and get on my knees and pray to a God that can never be defeated. Enemies can defeat me. People can destroy me. But no one, no one can thwart the plan of God. No one can thwart what God wants to do. And it's in that that we rest in. It's that that we have faith in and we have hope in. This Christmas prophecy that Isaiah is bringing is a beautiful one because it talks about a child who is born and that the government will be on his shoulders forever and ever. What I've realized is my faith is based on a baby. (laughs) My faith is based on a baby that was born out of wedlock, born in a (laughs) humble, dirty, disgusting place. It would not fit the expectations of anyone whatsoever. But I believe, I believe that it is in God's plan that he sent his son to die for us so that we can experience eternal life. My my charge on you as we go through this season is to give up your expectations, to give up your man-made hopes, to give up surrender and lay it at the foot of the cross. And not only do that, but come on your knees before Christ like a servant and say, Lord, these are my expectations, these are my hopes, these are my dreams, and I give them all to you. And I would rather have what you want for me, whatever that may be. And the beautiful thing about Jesus The beautiful thing about God is that when we give to him our expectations, our hopes, and our dreams, and we lay it at the foot of the cross, I guarantee you he will give you far greater things because he loves you and he cares about you. But first and foremost, we have to trust him that even if he is taking you to a hard and difficult place, that if you have a humble and submissive heart unto him, that that is far more important than you being blessed. Our blessing is found when we shift our hope from external circumstances to hope in the word. That whether we are rich or poor, whether we are powerful or weak, that whether we are healthy or sick, that all of this is secondary 
to us coming before the cross and giving our lives to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we have so many expectations and so much hope. Especially in this time of Christmas, we, we, we hope for gifts, we hope for love, and we hope for satisfaction in our days. And Father, I, I know a lot of us have the heart of the disciples. As they followed Jesus, they expected Jesus to overthrow the Romans, to overthrow the governments, and, and to put the government on his shoulders, and to be the ruler and the king. And they were sorely disappointed when Jesus was hung on a cross. Father, I pray that you would do the same with us. That you would disappoint us <laughs> in our own expectations and reveal to us your true plan. I pray that in our, dis and mis our missed expectations and our disappointments that we would learn that your plan is far greater. That we would experience the resurrection of Christ. That all the failures and all of our hardships that we've experienced this year would be resurrected and made new and made fresh, not because of anything we've done, but because you are good. Father, I pray for those of us that have had a hard year, a difficult year, and I pray that your Holy Spirit would renew us and restore us, not by the work of man, but by the work of Christ. Let our expectations and hopes not be rested on ourselves, but be rested in the cross. We love you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for bringing Jesus in the form of a child, born of the Virgin Mary. That Lord, even though, even uh, that whole situation of him being born in a manger amongst the animals, in such a dirty place, not fit for a king, God, that you, even then, taught us not to focus on the external expectations that we have, that sometimes your will is done in the worst of expectations, in the worst circumstances. Father, I pray that as we focus even on the cross, that as the expectations of the disciples were sorely missed, that Lord, even in our lives, when our expect expectations of your will are missed, that we would still trust that your plan is good, and that the resurrection is possible. So Father, I pray that no matter what circumstance we may be in right now, that we would believe in the power of resurrection, in the power of reconciliation and redemption, that you can bring back to life what is dead in you. Father, would you give us that heart of Christmas? And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.